Hello, Saddleback. I want to say hi to all 20 of our campuses, including those of you who are joining us online. If you'll take out your message notes. Today, we're continuing in our series on the foundations of a life well lived. There are three parts to laying a solid foundation for your life. First, you have to know who God made you to be. That's your identity. And if you're confused about your identity, uh, you're gonna waste your life. Because what matters is not what other people say about you, but what matters is what God says about you. And because he always knows and tells the truth, you wanna listen to what he has to say about you. And we've already looked at that. Now, the second part of the foundation is you gotta know what God wants you to do. That's your purpose. For, first, you need to know your identity, and then you need to know your purpose. What on earth am I here for? You gotta know who you are, and you've gotta know what you were created to do. Then, the third part of a life well lived is you gotta know when to do it. And that's the right timing who you are, what you're supposed to do with your life, and when you're supposed to do it. Now, when all three of these line up in your life, your identity and your purpose and your timing, you have the ingredients for a successful life. Now, today, I want you to see God's five purposes for the rest of your life. But to set this up, I first wanna ask you a question. Who would you guess was the greatest king uh, in the Bible? I don't know if you've been reading the Bible for a long time or just a little time, but you might guess King David because he's certainly the most famous king. He wrote Psalm 23 and so many other great Psalms. You might guess Solomon who was the wisest king. The Bible tells us he was the wisest and wealthiest king. You might guess Saul who was the first king of Israel. But God says the greatest king of all in the Bible was a little known king named Hezekiah. And the Bible tells us all about him in 2 Kings chapter 18. Let me read this to you. Chapter 18 of 2 Kings, verses two to seven. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned Jerusalem 29 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. Hezekiah trusted the Lord. And there was never another king like him in the land of Judah, either before him or after his time. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything, and he carefully obeyed all the commands of the Lord that he had been given by Moses. So the Lord was with him, and Hezekiah, watch this, was successful in everything he did. Can you imagine that? How would you like to have God say that about you, that you were successful in everything you do? I'm certainly not that successful. Uh, You're not that successful. But the Bible tells us that this guy was. What made Hezekiah special? God says Hezekiah was successful in everything that he did, that he was the greatest king uh, in Israel. There was nobody before him or after him who even came close. Why? Because he always did what God wanted him to do. He knew who he was, he knew his purpose, and he knew the right timing. Now, if you'd like to be successful in everything you do, I highly suggest that you study this man's life, Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah lived an amazing life, but eventually, of course, Hezekiah grew older, and he starts having health problems. In fact, Hezekiah came down with a terminal illness. And in Isaiah chapter 38, it tells us the rest of the story. And that's what I want us to focus on uh, first uh, today. God comes to Hezekiah and says, Hezekiah, you're gonna die. Your time's up. I'm pulling your number. I'm pulling the plug. I want you to come home to heaven. But interestingly enough, Hezekiah wasn't ready to die. So he gives God a 32-word argument on why God should let him live and serve God longer on earth. Now that part of the story, as I said, is recorded uh, in Isaiah. In Isaiah 38, verses one to five, it says this. Later, this is much toward the end of his life, Hezekiah got sick and he was about to die. And the prophet Isaiah comes and says, Hezekiah, prepare your affairs and your family. This is it, you're going to die. You're not gonna get well from this uh, illness. The Bible says Hezekiah turned away from Isaiah and facing the wall, he prayed to God. 
And here's what he prays. God, please, I beg you, remember how I've lived my life. Remember that I've lived faithfully in your presence, that I've lived out a heart out of a heart that was totally yours. You've seen how I've lived and the good that I have done. And it says, then God said, you know, Hezekiah, I've heard your prayer and I've seen your tears. And here's what I'll do. I'll add 15 years to your life. That is one of the most amazing stories in the Bible to me. Can you imagine you doing this with God? That you're uh, near death, that God's told you you're gonna die, you're gonna go to heaven, and you ask God to extend your life and ministry because you've done everything he asked you to do? God, I'd like to live on earth longer, and here's my reason. I've served you faithfully. Now, first, God, he says, I want you to look at my life, and God, I want you to notice that I faithfully obeyed you and I did everything that you told me to do. And second, I want you to look at all the good that I've done for other people and look at the impact my life has had for your glory and for the good of others. Well, that's what Hezekiah does, and evidently, God agreed with him. He agreed with Hezekiah's assessment of his own life because he says to Hezekiah, when Hezekiah says, Lord, I'd like to serve you on earth just a little while longer and I'll make it count, God says, you know, Hezekiah, I believe you. I know you will. So I'm going to extend your life for 15 more years. Not just the donation of his life, but the duration of his life is going to be increased. Now, friends, this is one of the most hopeful stories in the Bible. And it makes me want to ask you, as well as to ask myself, uh, three very personal questions. Here's the first question. If God asked you to give him reasons why he should let you live 15 years longer from today, what would you say? What, what would be your argument? God, you should let me live 15 years young, longer. Second question, if God reviewed the last 15 years of your life and he looked to see how well you had served him and how uh, you had served his purposes and how you'd been a good steward of what he gave you, and that was the basis of God deciding on whether he was gonna give you 15 more years, would God have a reason to extend your life? Or would he say, mm, no, I, I don't think you're serious about using your life to serve others. I don't think you're serious about fulfilling the purpose that I made you for, so I, I don't think I'm gonna give you any more time. Now here's the third question. Regardless of the time you have left in your life, and you don't know how much that is, neither do I, are you serious about using the rest of your time on earth and your energy and your resources to serve the God who created you and loves you and saves you and helps you? Let me repeat that question because it's gonna determine not just the donation of your life, what you give back, the contribution you make with your life, but it also may determine the duration of your life, how many more years God gives you. Are you willing to use the rest of your time on earth and your energy and your resources to serve God and his purposes for your life? If your answer is no, then why should God give you another day to waste? On the other hand, if your answer is yes, then you need to listen very closely to the rest of this message so you can be certain to learn God's five purposes for your life. Now, God chose to give Hezekiah 15 more years of life because he had made the most of the previous years. He had not wasted his life. He was a good steward of all that God had given him. And that's what God is looking for in your life. Let me show you a couple of related Bible verses. These are from the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter five, verse 15 to 17, it's very important, listen to what it says. Be careful how you live. Live wisely, not foolishly. Make the most of your time and take every opportunity to do good because evil is everywhere. Don't live carelessly without thinking. Instead, make sure you understand what the Lord wants you to do with your life. You know, I wanna ask myself and ask you these, this question. 
Are you doing these five things right now? Are you being careful with your life? Are you living wisely? Are you making the most of your time? Are you taking every opportunity to do good? Are you making sure that you know what God wants you to do with your life? Those are important things. All five of those things are important. Then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, it says this. If you keep your life clean from sin, you will be an instrument that God can use for his highest purposes. I want that with my life. And I want that with your life, that you can be an instrument that God uses for his highest purposes. How do you do that? By keeping your life clean. Now today, the five purposes that God has for the rest of your life are what we wanna look at. And you know what? It's no secret. God isn't playing games. He's very, very clear in the Bible about what these five things he wants you to do are. He he tells us over and over again these five things in different ways in different passages. So let's get right into it. Number one, write this down. The first purpose of your life. God wants me to center my life around him. God wants me to center my life around him. He he didn't put us on earth to live self-centered lives. Instead, he wants us to live God-centered lives, to learn how to love him and how to enjoy him and to enjoy his love to us. He wants us to have a friendship with him. God made you to love you, and he wants you to build your life with him at the core, at the center. God wants to be the nucleus of your life, not a piece of the pie, not a section, not a selection, not a periphery, not a part of your life. He wants to be the center. He doesn't want to be on the edge of your life, not in a segment of your life, but at the very, very core, the center. God wants to be the hub of your heart. He wants to be the axis of your existence. He wants to be the focal point and the focus of your attention. If I were to summarize it, I'd say it this way. God wants to have a love affair with you because when you have somebody at the focal point and focus of your attention, you're in love with them. And God wants a love affair with you. One day Jesus is walking down the street and a man comes up and says, what's the most important command in the entire Bible? And Jesus says, I can summarize it. Matthew 22, verse 37 and 38. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. Circle first and greatest. This is the first purpose of your life, to let God love you and to learn to love him back, to know Christ, to make him the center of your life. The most important thing you can do is to know God, and the most important thing you can uh, experience in life is to experience his love, to let God love you and learn to love you back. Why? Because God made you to have a relationship with him. He didn't make you to not have a relationship. Now, this first purpose, you might write this down, is called worship. A lot of people think worship means singing. No, no, singing is one way to worship, but there are hundreds of ways to worship. Worship is simply enjoying God's love and loving him back. Worship is enjoying God's love and loving him back. It's having a friendship, a relationship with God. Anytime you focus on God, you're worshiping. Anytime you get your eyes off your problems and onto Jesus, you're worshiping. Anytime you talk to him or you listen to him, you're worshiping. Worship is centering my life on God. Now here's the truth. You're gonna center your life around something. You may center it around your career. You may center it around your family. You may center around making money or being famous or your your hobby or whatever. Anything besides God at the center of your life, you know what that's called? An idol. And the Bible says you will have no idols, no gods before me, and don't make any idols. How, How do you know, by the way, when something else has taken the center of your life instead of God? How do you know when something's taken the place of God at the nucleus, at the heart of your life. Real simple, you start worrying. Worry is the warning light that something besides God is at the center of your life. You start stressing out, you get fearful. In contrast to that, how can you tell when God is the center of your life? When your life is centered on him, you're at peace. You stop worrying. Look at this verse. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 7, a sense of God's wholeness 
everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Isn't that a beautiful paraphrase of Philippians? Worship is the antidote to worry. It's your choice. So the first and most important question in your life is this. What's gonna be the center of my life for the rest of my life? This is the most important issue that you decide, and it's the issue of worship. Now, let me give you a little hint. Nothing else is strong enough to hold you together. Anything else you put at the center of your life, whether it's a sport or a hobby or a career or money or fun or family or any other activity, it's not strong enough to hold you together when the heat's on and the earthquakes happen in your life. You have to have God at the center, and that's what worship is all about. And God says, if you're gonna live here on earth, that's what I want you to do. First, make me number one, put me at the focus, at the nucleus. Here's the second purpose. God wants me to learn to love his family. Did you know that? God, the whole issue of life is learning how to love God and learn how to love other people. He puts you here on earth to learn how to love. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, why, why does God, why is he so interested in love? Because God is love. In fact, God is love, and he created you as an object of his love. God wanted a family. That family is called the church. It's the only thing that's gonna last forever. And God wants me to find a, a local church and join it and get connected so I can learn what I call the 56 one another's in the Bible. 56 times in the Bible, the phrase one another is used. And it says, love one another, care for one another, help one another, pray for one another, serve one another, greet one another, comfort one another. There are 56 of these in the Bible. Where are you gonna do that if you're not a part of some local church? See, God uses the church as a laboratory for learning how to really love. And God says, you know, if you love me, but you don't know how to love my family, you're just kidding yourself. He says, you can't say you love God and not love other people. Church is the lab for learning to love. Now in heaven, you know what you're gonna do in heaven? Well, one of the things you're gonna do in heaven is you're gonna love the rest of God's family. Right now, here on earth, he wants you to practice before you get there. He wants you to practice learning how, now it's easy to love people who are lovely, like you, but he wants to teach you how to learn unlovely people. It's like that little poem, to dwell above with those we love, well, that will be a glory. But to dwell below with those we know, that's another story. <laughs> See, God doesn't leave you on earth to live in an isolated, insulated life. Yes, he wants you to love him, but he also wants you to learn to love his family. And in Hebrews 10, 25, it says this, let us not give up the habit, circle that word, habit. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together. It's what we're doing right now. He says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us encourage one another. Every time we meet in, in, in a small group, in a worship service, or any, any time else we meet as a members of God's family, we encourage each other. Now, this second purpose, write this down, is called fellowship. The first purpose of your life is worship, centering God at the center of your life. The second purpose of your life is fellowship, learning to love God's family. And God expects you to make fellowship a habit. He says, don't give up that habit. Why? Because you need encouragement. You know, you were created for relationships. That's why the very first thing God said after he made man was, it's not good for man to be alone. Now, he's not talking about shallow relationships. He's talking about significant ones. You know, I read again this week here in the state of California that the Department of Mental Health in California did a study and they discovered that if you isolate yourself from other people and you don't develop any close friendships, fellowship, listen to, here's the result. You are three times more likely to die an early death. You are four times more likely to suffer emotional burnout you are five times more likely to be clinically depressed, and you are 10 times more likely to be hospitalized for an emotional or mental disorder. If you don't have supportive, loving relationships, fellowship in your life. 
So if you're still not in a small group here at Saddleback Church, you owe it to your own health to get in a small group, to start one. It is absolutely imperative for your physical health, not just your spiritual health, and for your emotional health and your mental health. The Bible tells us that everyone has a longing for belonging. We all need to feel connected. The Bible calls this fellowship, and it means living life together. So it's not enough just to make God the center of your life. The Christian life is not a solo act. We're never meant to face life alone. I've told you many, many times the small group that I've been in for nearly two decades has been a lifesaver for me. Now, how does God want you to connect with other believers? Well, he gives us a practical model uh, in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter two, it talks about the very first church. It was a church at Jerusalem. And in Acts uh, chapter two, verses 41 and 42 and 40, 46, it gives us a number of things that they did. All of these things are elements of fellowship. So I want us to read this. I wanna re read it aloud together, okay? I want you to read this, Acts chapter two, 41, 42, and 46, aloud with me at whatever campus you're at. So I'm, I'll read it slow, okay? Let's read it together. Those who believed were baptized and added to the church. And they joined the church with other believers and committed themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. They worshiped together regularly at the temple and they met in small groups in homes. Now I want you to notice that the, that passage is very, very specific and I want you to note the order of fellowship. First, he says they believe. God wants you to believe in Jesus Christ. Second, he wants you to be baptized. That's the second thing that's mentioned. Third, they joined a church family, the fellowship. And you could take class 101 here at Saddleback Church, join our church family. Fourth, they committed to regular worship and Bible study. It said the apostles' teaching. What's the apostles' teaching? It's the New Testament. It's, it's the Bible in the New Testament. So they committed to worship and Bible study. And finally, they connected to a small group fellowship in a home. Now, let me just pause here and ask, which of these steps have you taken? Are there any that you haven't taken? Uh, if, if you haven't taken any, circle that one. You need to be baptized. You need to join a small group. You need to join a church family. Now, if you've taken all five of these steps, you just need to ride underneath it, be consistent in it. Keep on Bible study, doing Bible study. Keep on worshiping with others. Keep on being in a small group. If God gives you 15 more years like he gave Hezekiah, he expects you to do these things because this is the second purpose of life, fellowship with other believers, worship of God. Number three, the third purpose of life is this. God wants me to cultivate spiritual maturity. He wants me to become like Jesus Christ. He wants me to grow up. God doesn't leave you here on earth just to remain a spiritual baby. He wants me to cultivate spiritual maturity. As I said, he wants you to grow up. Once you're born into God's family, he wants you to grow in God's family. And he wants you to grow in knowing his word and in trusting his wisdom and in obeying his instructions and in loving his family and in developing the character of Christ, becoming more and more like Jesus, thinking like Jesus and feeling like Jesus and having the attitudes of Jesus. Hebrews chapter six, verse one, talks about this purpose. It says this, let us go on, in other words, keep going, and become mature in our understanding as strong Christians ought to be. God wants you to grow up. This third purpose, by the way, if you wanna write this down, is called discipleship. Discipleship. Centering my life around God, worship. Loving God's family, fellowship. Growing spiritually in my character, what I do and think and act and say, discipleship. Now what's discipleship? Well, disciple is just an old word for student. It means a learner. God wants you to be a lifelong learner for the rest of your life. That's what a disciple is. It just means you're growing. You don't get stuck. You know, sadly, a lot of people today grow old uh, without growing up spiritually. They grow old without growing up. They get stuck in perpetual immaturity. They're saved, but they're shallow. Those of you who are parents, it, if you had kids 
and they never grew up. That would be a tragedy. And a, a, a follower of Christ who doesn't grow up, that's tragic. Now, how do you know when you're mature? Well, one of the ways you know when you're spiritually mature is you're able to explain life, the Christian life, and God's purposes to other people. Look at this verse, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. By now, you should be teachers. Instead, you need someone still to teach, teach you. One of the marks of maturity is that you're able to pass on to others what you have learned about life. You see, maturity is not an end in itself. Maturity is for ministry. Now, let me be really clear. Some people are actually gifted to teach. They have the gift of teaching. And God doesn't give the gift of teaching to everybody, but God expects all of us to teach at some point in our life. We teach our friends, we teach our children, we teach each other, we teach in one-on-one -on -one conversations, you teach in a small group when you contribute. One of the goals of Saddleback Church is to help you grow so that you can teach others. That's what God wants us. By this time, you ought to be able to pass it on to be a teacher of others. We've got a lot of ways to help you do this. Class 101, Class 201, 301, and 401. We have Bible studies. We have retreats. We have small groups. We have the Daily Hope devotional. We have Pastor Tom's drive time devotions. The Bible says this, take the time and trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. Now, we all know it's good to have a plan if you're doing physical fitness, but you might need to think through, not might, you should need to think through a plan for spiritual fitness. So here's the question. I wanna ask you as we're looking at the year ahead, in which area of your life do you need to grow the most this year? Just, I want you to think about that. I want you to go home and think about this question because this is the third purpose. If God wants you to grow and mature, you need to say, where am I gonna grow and mature this year? Is it in, I need a better understanding of the Bible? That'd be a good growth goal. Is it, uh, I, I need to learn to overcome temptation, a particular one in my life? That's a good goal. Is it obeying God in faith when it doesn't make sense and yet God says do it? And you go, well, I'm gonna learn to do it in faith. Is it being more disciplined in an area of your life that's not disciplined? Is it growing in love and other Christ-like attitudes? These are all areas that God wants you to grow, and that's the third purpose of your life. Worship, center God in your life. Fellowship, learn to love his family. And then maturity or discipleship, learn to grow spiritually. Now here's the fourth purpose that God leaves you on earth for. And if you're not gonna do these, God should just go ahead and take you on to heaven now. But here's the fourth thing God wants you to do with your life. God wants me to contribute something back. He doesn't want to leave you here on earth just to live for yourself, to consume resources, take up space, and then die. No, God should go ahead and take you on to heaven. If you're not gonna contribute anything with your life, if you're just gonna live for yourself, why leave you here one more second? God wants you to learn to be unselfish. He wants you to learn to be generous. He wants you to learn how to serve others with whatever talents and abilities and time and opportunities he's given to you. The Bible says it like this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, the fourth purpose of life. God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other. Notice it doesn't say be sure to use them to make a lot of money. He says God gave you talents and abilities or what we call your shape, your gifts, your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personality, your experiences to help other people. Now this is the fourth purpose of your life, giving back, making a contribution. By the way, this fourth purpose is called ministry. You might write that down. When you give back, when you make a contribution with your life, when you serve somebody else instead of just serving yourself, that's called your ministry. Anytime you help anybody else in any way, you have just ministered to them. And anytime you use your talents to, to give back, to make a contribution, that is called your ministry. Maybe you've never realized this, but you or a minister. Did you know that in the Bible, the word for service and ministry are the same word? And the word for serving and ministering are the same word. You know, the Bible tells us that we're to serve God, but how do you serve a God who's invisible? Well, the Bible tells us real clearly, we serve God by serving others. You know, this again is just preparation for where you're going ultimately. 
in heaven, you're not just gonna sit around being bored with nothing to do. No, no, in heaven, you're gonna serve. We're gonna serve God, we're gonna serve each other. You'll have a place of service that you love and you enjoy because it maximizes the talents God gave you. And you're gonna be fulfilled at it and you're gonna love doing it and we'll all serve each other in fulfilling ways and significant ways and we're gonna do it forever and ever and ever. Now, you're not there yet, so why are you still here on earth? Well, here on earth, God wants you to practice your serve. Okay, he wants you to practice ministering. You might wanna turn to somebody right now and just say, you're a minister. Because the fact is, we're all ministers. We're all, we're all servants of God. Jesus said it like this. If you wanna be great, learn to be the servant of everybody. You know, we weren't made to do nothing. I read a study again this week that in, in, in the state of New York, one half of all New York men will die within two years of their retirement. That's a scary statistic. One half of all New York men will die within two years of their retirement. Why? Because we're not designed for 24-hour leisure. We're made to make a contribution. We're made for meaning. We're made for significance. You're shaped for significance. Anytime I hear somebody say, you know, I just live for the weekends. Well, I know what they mean. I, their work isn't that fulfilling. And I, but to say I live for the weekends, then why should God keep you on earth? because you're missing your purpose. You weren't put here just to have fun. God wanted you to grow in character and God wanted you to make a contribution. And one day you're gonna stand before God and he's gonna say, what did you do with what I gave you? The talents and the abilities and all that I put in you. Now, if God chooses to let you live tomorrow or next week or this next year or for 10 or 15 years like Hezekiah, uh, you really should ask the question that David did in Psalm 116, verse 12. This is a great question to ask. Psalm 116, verse 12. David says, what can I give back to God for the blessings that he's poured out on me? What a great question. How long has it been since you asked that? Have you ever asked that question? What can I give back to God for all the blessings that he's given to me? I wanna pause just a moment to think about that question. What can I give back to God for the blessings that he's poured out on me? You know, as a pastor, I've talked to thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people, and I, I've noticed that everybody craves significance. We're all hungry to feel like our lives mattered, uh, that, that our lives have meaning, that there's a, a greater purpose to live for. We all want significance. And everybody's on this search for significance around the world. Let me give you a little secret. Significance doesn't come from status. Significance doesn't come from salary. Significance doesn't come from success. Significance comes from service. Jesus said, it is only in giving your life away that you'll ever really know what it means to live. So where are you making an unselfish contribution to the world. This is the fourth purpose of your life. Where am I serving as a volunteer? Where am I serving without pay? What is your ministry in your spiritual family here at Saddleback Church? That's the fourth purpose. Finally, there's one more purpose in your life. We've got discipleship and we've got worship and we've got fellowship, we've got ministry. Finally, God leaves me here on earth for a fifth purpose and I want you to write this down. God wants me to tell others about his love. Once you know, he wants you to tell other people. Somebody told you, that's why you're in the family. Who have you told? God doesn't leave you here just to enjoy his grace and love. Somebody told you, now God expects you to tell others. He wants you to pass it on. Now think about this. Here on earth, there are only two things that you can't do in heaven. You can pray in heaven, you can sing in heaven, you can fellowship in heaven, you can grow in heaven, you can worship in heaven, you can serve in heaven, um, uh, you can sleep in heaven, you can eat in heaven, you can relax and have fun in heaven. There are only two things you can't do in heaven that you can do here on earth. One of them is sin. There's no sin in heaven, so you can't sin in heaven. 
And the only other thing you can't do in heaven that you can do here is share the good news with somebody who's never heard it. Be a witness. Share the good news. Sharing the good news with somebody who's never heard it because none of those people are gonna be in heaven. Now, of those two things, sin, you can't do that in heaven, or tell other people the good news about God's love, which of those two do you think God leaves you here on earth to do? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of obvious. He doesn't leave you here to sin. He leaves you here to tell other people. And the Bible says it very clearly. Here's just one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and verse 20. Through Christ, God has made peace between us and himself, and he gave us the work of telling everyone about the peace we can have with him. So we have been sent to speak for Christ. Notice, God has given us a work to do, and that work is to tell other people about the love of God and the peace we can have with God. This is the fifth purpose of your life. By the way, if you wanna write this down, the fifth purpose is called witnessing. Witnessing. The Bible says you are a witness of God's love. Now, if you've ever watched court TV, or if you've ever um, been in a court, you know there's a big difference between an attorney and a witness. An attorney is the guy who is presenting all the facts and making the case and asking for a judgment and trying to persuade and convince. That's not your job. Your job is to simply be a witness. A witness doesn't try to persuade and convince. A witness just says, here's what happened to me. Here's what I experienced, here's what I saw, here's what I know, and you are an authority as a witness because you're an authority on you. Nobody else can be your witness. A witness just shares their personal experience. It's called your testimony, the story of what God has done in your life. You don't have to know any of the Bible to be a witness. You just say, this is what's happened to me, this is my experience. And the Bible says we are to share the good news as witnesses, where? Everywhere. You're to be a witness at home to family members who don't know the Lord. You're to be a witness at work to coworkers who don't know the Lord. You're to be a witness in your neighborhood, in the grocery store. You're to be a witness to the whole world on peace trips. You know, it's a sobering fact to realize that every single person you know is gonna spend eternity somewhere, heaven or hell. And the greatest thing that you can do for someone the greatest privilege is to share the good news. You know, if I had the cure for cancer and I didn't share it, that would be criminal. If I had the cure for AIDS or for dementia uh, or heart disease and I didn't share it with the world, that would be criminal. We have something more important than that. We have how to have your past forgiven, how to get a purpose for living, how to get a home in heaven. Who else is gonna share that message? And if you don't share it, why should God leave you here on earth? Now, there are two ways that we communicate our witness. We do it with our lives, and we do it with our words. We do it audio, and we do it visual. You need to be an audio-visual Christian. Now, here's the question. Who do you know who doesn't know Jesus? Who do you know who doesn't know Jesus? Who do you think is responsible for that person? You are. In fact, I want you to right now write down one name of somebody you love who doesn't know Jesus yet. Write down the name of somebody you love, one person who doesn't know Jesus. And your fifth purpose is to help that person meet Jesus. If you're not gonna do that, why should God let you live another day? It's one of the five purposes. It's the, one of the two things you can't do in heaven. So he's not leaving here to sin. Now you say, well, how do I do that? How do I be a witness? First, just start praying for him. It's really easy, just start, if you start praying for him, God will open up all kinds of doors. You can invite him to church, bring him, bring him to a service. You, you can in, invite him to a small group. Ask God for an opportunity to share your story. Now here's the good news. All of these purposes, whether it's worship, or fellowship, or discipleship, or ministry, or witness, you don't have to do them by yourself. We'll all help you. We'll pray for you. We'll work with you. We'll be friendly to your friends. We'll plan good services at Saddleback Church. Together as a church, we are a group witness. And when people come to Saddleback and they see all these people go, wow, there's a lot of people whose lives have been changed. The purpose of the church is to help you fulfill God's five purposes for your life.
That's why we call ourselves at Saddleback a purpose-driven church, because our goal is to help you fulfill these five purposes. This year, we're planning a lot of events and a lot of programs and a lot of tools and resources to help you fulfill the God, five purposes that God put you here on earth. Now, I wanna close by reading you um, a, a couple of letters that, uh, that show how we're better together as a church family. I, I get these letters almost every day. Here's the, the first letter I got. Uh, Dear Pastor Rick, a, a year ago after a devastating loss, uh, I moved here to Southern California and disconnected from everything. I was very lonely and I cried solid for three weeks. I finally decided I, I should try a church. From the moment I stepped inside my first service at Saddleback, I felt I belonged here. And to shorten my story, Christ became real to me and I joined this church family and I'm now serving in a ministry and this is very, very fulfilling to me. I love being a part of this family here. My loneliness and my pain was almost unbearable without a church family. But when I look at the membership class, and when I took the membership class, I had to hold back tears of joy when you discussed how Saddleback is a family. It really is. And I'm so grateful for my brothers and sisters here and for a church that I can call home. That's fulfilling the purposes of God. And here's another one, a second letter. Dear Pastor Rick, I was attending another well-known church here in Orange County, but it was too big, so I switched to Saddleback. <laughs> Follow me on the rest of this letter. It was too big, so I switched to Saddleback. I know what you're thinking. Saddleback has a lot of people too, but it doesn't seem big to me since I joined a small group. And in my group, we care for each other and we laugh together and we help each other out of so many practical ways. I tell people that Saddleback is the biggest small church I've ever been a part of. <laughs> you know, these are the five purposes God has for your life. And I want you to go home this week and, and make a plan to work on each of them. How do I make Christ the center of my life? Worship, to let him love me and love him back. How do I learn to uh, love God's family more and express God's family commitment by being a part of joining our church family? How, how do I grow in Christ? How do I serve God by serving others? And how do I tell the good news to somebody around me who doesn't know it? You know, next weekend uh, is my birthday, and Pastor Tom is gonna interview me about the personal lessons that I've learned over 40 years of seeking to fulfill God's purposes in my life. I hope, I hope you won't miss that interview because it's gonna be very personal and I'm gonna share uh, some things that, that I've never shared before. I wanna close with one last verse. It's there on your outline. And this verse is my prayer for you this week. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse one says this. In our work together with God, we beg those of you who have received God's grace to not let it be wasted. Would you underline that last phrase? Not let it be wasted. As your pastor who loves you, who cares about you, I beg you, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Give God a reason to give you 15 more years like he gave Hezekiah. Give God a reason to look at your life, go, man, you were fulfilling the purposes that I put you on earth to do. So I'm gonna give you another 15 years just like I gave Hezekiah. Let me pray for you. Would you bow your heads? <sighs> With our heads bowed, why don't, why don't you follow me in this prayer? It's a prayer of confession and it's a prayer of commitment. Say, Father, I have to admit that I haven't always used my life in the way you intended. And, and I'm sorry. But now that I know what you want me to do, I want to change. And I wanna use my life that you've given me for the purposes that you made me for. Starting right now, I wanna center my life around you. I wanna to learn to love you and learn to let you love me. And I, I wanna get better connected to other believers in your family. I wanna build relationships in my church home here. I, I, I wanna to grow to spiritual maturity. 
I want to be like Christ, and I want to make a contribution with my life. I want to start giving back unselfishly, and I want you to use me to start sharing your love to people who don't know you. Jesus, thank you for giving me my life, and thank you for giving me this church family where I can learn your purposes for me. If you've never opened your life to Jesus Christ, say, Jesus Christ, I wanna believe in you. I wanna invite you into my life today. I wanna be baptized as you commanded. And I pray this humbly in your name, amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online pastor. I wanna invite you to take your next step by checking out our online community or help get you connected to a local Saddleback campus. Three things we have to offer you right now. First, learn more about belonging to a church family by taking class 101. Second, don't live life alone and get into community with others by joining an online small group or a local home group in your area. Third, join our Facebook group to be more engaged with our online community throughout the week. Take your next step and learn where a local campus is near you by visiting saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.